I'm going to get started. I hope you can hear me clearly. Wanted to begin class with just a reminder that test two is next Thursday, March 25th. Uh, so it'll be in a lecture time, a Zoom lecture time, and it'll be on Zoom. You'll just um, call into Zoom. It will have the same format as test one. So there'll be the multiple choice, there'll be the same number of multiple choice questions, the same points. There'd be the numerical answer, there'd be the same number of um, numerical answer questions and points. And then there'll be the uh, fully worked out problem. The material is the material we've been covering since test one. So from March 2nd through to um, uh, next Tuesday, March 23rd. So that material is material on magnetism. That was uh, chapter chapter 19. We talked about talked about um, magnetic forces. We talked about magnetic fields and we talked about how moving charged particles or electrical currents create magnetic fields and experience uh, magnetic forces. Then we moved on to a new phenomena that's the bridge between electricity and magnetism. And that phenomena is um, induction. And we talked about that last class. We'll talk about this class and the next class and then finally, there's some material on the joining together of electricity and magnetism uh, from chapter 21, that's next, next Tuesday. Any questions about test two before I start today's lecture class? So you could throw them into um, chat. I'm looking at chat right now. Um, or you could just um, shout out. Okay, well, I don't see any questions right now. So I'll just um, uh, plow ahead, I guess. If you have any questions about the test, you can also ask me at the end of today's class, or of course you can ask me in office hours or another class. So last class we introduced induction and Faraday's law for induction. And today's class, I want to look at some examples, illustrations of Faraday's law and induction. And actually, also in Thursday's class, we'll continue with some examples, illustrations of induction. It a free specific topics that I want to work through in today's class. And the first one is I want to demonstrate and discuss how we can induce currents, induce EMFs through translational, so here to there motion. And specifically, we'll talk about this equation here for the induced EMF in terms of translational motion through a magnetic field. So we're going to introduce that formula, discuss that formula, look at examples of that formula. Topic one. Um, Second topic I want to talk about is how induced currents, induced EMFs, can be generated by rotational motion, so angular velocity. And 
specifically there, we're going to introduce a new formula. I've written it down here for the induced EMF, or could be the induced current. It's this formula here. And it tells us how rotational motion, angular velocity in a magnetic field creates an induced EMF and creates an induced current. So those are two important examples of how motion, rotational motion, translational motion lead to induced currents, induced EMFs. They're very important in our modern lives. They are heart of our modern, you know, technology and comfort and all that. So that's the bulk of the class there. The, the third topic I want to discuss doesn't involve motion, create an induced EMFs or induced currents. The third topic I want to discuss is where time varying magnetic fields create induced currents and induced EMFs. And I'm going to introduce in today's class, hopefully, the concept of in, or idea of inductors and the concept idea of in, inductance. And actually, we'll talk more about inductors, inductance in the, in the next class, in Thursday's class as well. There's a important point here about induction and specifically about Faraday's law of induction. And so I wanted to stress this important point about Faraday's law of induction. It's very unusual as a law of physics. It's very interesting as a law of physics. So you look at that law that says induced EMF is the negative time rate of change of magnetic flux. A little bit of a mouthful, but you know, as an equation, it's a pretty simple equation. EMF equals the negative time rate of change of the flux. That law, that law is kind of deceptively simple. That law is actually quite subtle. And by that, I mean that that law actually contains or embodies two different effects, two different phenomena. So one of them is that induction occurs when you have moving parts, moving circuits. So one way of making juice currents and juice EMFs is if you have motion of electrical circuits in, in magnetic fields. In that case, you get through the motion of the electrical circuits and magnetic fields, you get electric magnetic forces. And so that's one, one way induction occurs. But there's actually a second type of induction, induction when you don't have moving parts, moving circuits. And uh, in that case, it's time varying magnetic fields creating electrical forces that can create the induced currents, the induced EMFs. And so it's, I, I was think in a way to me, Faraday's law is the most interesting law of physics because it's the only one I know that embodied in it, contained in it is actually two different phenomena. And the same single law that the induced EMF is negative rate of change of the magnetic flux actually describes both these phenomena. And so in today's class, we're mostly going to work on the moving circuits and induced EMS. And then at the end of today's class, we'll start the um, what we call transformer EMFs when we have circuits without moving parts. OK, so topic number one, induction with translational motion. So in this sketch here is an ex illustration or example of induction due to translational motion. So let me say it 
a few words about this sketch. There's quite a lot of information, quite a lot of detail in this sketch. So firstly, in this sketch, I've got a region of magnetic field. I didn't label it. But you can see the field lines in this nice turquoise. They're heading into the into the screen, into the slide. And so this is a region of, um, of magnetic field. In this region of magnetic field is, you might not immediately recognize it, but there is an uh, electrical circuit. So the circuit is made of several pieces. Firstly, there's a conducting rail upstairs here and a conducting rail downstairs here. So two parallel rails. Then secondly, there is this bar or rod, kind of looks like a gold bar or brass bar or rod. And that's being pushed from left to right across the rails and through the magnetic field. And then the circuit is completed over here there's a wire, a resistor, another wire to complete the circuit. So the circuit that we have is this circuit here. There's a complete conducting loop made out of the rails, the rod and the wires and resistors. And uh, we're going to be interested in the EMF that's induced in that circuit and the current that's induced in that circuit. So, so why is there an EMF induced in the circuit? Why is there a current induced in the circuit? Well, we can see it from uh, Faraday's law of induction. So Faraday's law of induction says that if you've got a changing flux, magnetic flux through a circuit, then you get an induced EMF in the circuit. And the, the size of the induced EMF is in proportion to the rate at which the flux is changing. And that's the situation we got here. Think about that rod as it rolls from left to right across the rails. The circuit expands as the rod rolls from left to right across the rails. So as the rod moves towards the right, the circuit is getting bigger and bigger. As the circuit gets bigger and bigger, there's more field lines that are passing through the inside of the circuit. Um, as the number of field lines increases that are passing through the circuit, that means that the flux is changing through the circuit. The, the flux is getting bigger through the circuit. And so that's where the induced EMF, that's where the induced current comes from. As the rod is rolling left to right, the circuit is growing towards the right. The flux, magnetic flux through the circuit is growing. We're going to get an induced EMF, going to get induced current by Faraday's law. Upstairs here is an equation, important equation for that induced EMF. I'm going to think about the size of this induced EMF right now. So I've written the parallel vertical lines to indicate, I'm just worrying about the size here. The size here, as we already know, depends on the rate of change of the flux. And this equation here describes the rate of change of the flux for this situation of translational motion. So I'm not going to derive this equation, BLV, but let me explain this equation so it makes sense to you. So the B here, well, this is the magnetic field that the rod is moving through. And obviously, if we were to increase the magnetic field, increase the number of field lines, we'd increase the magnetic flux and increase the rate at which the flux is changing. 
So it makes sense, I think, that the, um, the induced EMF depends on the, the magnetic field strength. Uh, for example, if I switched off the field, if I had a little, I've got one over here, but a little switch, turn the field off. It's not going to be an induced EMF. It's not going to be an induced current because there's no field. So there's no flux so that there's no changing field, changing flux. So it should depend on B. Depends on the velocity V. So that's the velocity V. I've, I've labeled it down here of the rod, right? If I just gradually, very slowly push that rod from left to right, that would mean that the number of extra field lines through the circuit is just increasing slowly. That means the magnetic flux is just increasing slowly uh, so that the rate of change of the flux would be small. So it, if the speed is slow, we'd expect a, a small induced EMF. If I push really fast, right, I move the rod really fast across the rails, then I'm capturing more field lines much more quickly. Um, I'm changing the flux much more quickly. And so I'd expect a, um, uh, a big, bigger induced EMF. And of course, if I didn't move the rod at all, there'll be, well, there is a flux through the circuit, but there'd be no changing flux through the circuit. So there'd be no induced EMF. So we'd expect it to depend on V2. Finally, it depends on L. I've also indicated L here. That's the distance between the rails or the length of the rod we're rolling across the rails. It makes sense that the induced EMF also depends on L. So think of it this way. Imagine we have two of these arrangements. Imagine you had two of them. They were identical, except that in one case, the length of the rod and the separation of the rails was big. The other case, the length of the rod, the separation of the rails was small. In the case of the, the, the long rod and the well-separated rails, you'd capture many more field lines as you roll the rod left to right. In the case of the short rod and the short distance between the rails, you capture many less field lines as you roll the rod left to right. And so the longer the rod, the greater the separation between the rails, also the greater the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the circuit. The shorter the rod, the shorter the distance between the rails, um, the lesser the, the change in magnetic flux through the circuit. So it also depends it Makes sense that it depends on L. Okay, there was a question in chat. I'm a little confused about the notation here. Are we saying that the induced EMF is equal to VLV or is it delta T, only delta T equals VLV? No, it's this induced EMF equals this thing here. I've only put this in here because this is the general equation, Faraday's law. And so this BLV is the rate of change of magnetic flux. It is this d phi dt for this particular case of translational motion induced EMF. So I hope that helps. Uh, let me show you a demonstration. So maybe that will help too. So I'm going to share a different screen. Okay, so I hope you can see um, my campus page. And I'm going to show you this example of motional EMFs, motional currents, 
created by translational motion through a magnetic field. So let me explain what's in this um, in this video here. So you see these gray rectangles. Those are actually magnets. Four magnets left to right here, and on the top side of them, surface of them is their north pole, and the bottom side is their south pole. And magnetic field lines are sprouting out of these magnets. So this is a region of magnetic field, vertical magnetic field. So that's important. I wish we could see it, but you know, God, believe me, that's there. This is an aluminium rail over here in the background, and this is an aluminium rail here in the foreground. So these are the two rails that are going to help us with the circuit. I got two wires connected to the rails. There's a black wire leads to the rail in the foreground. There's a red wire leads to the rail in the background. background and they are connected, you can see here, connected to this voltmeter, or what we call galvanometer. And right now, there's no zero volts. There's zero induced EMF, zero induced current. But what I'm going to do in the video is roll or, or slide a rod along these rails to complete the circuit. And we'll see the induced current, see the induced EMF. Let me get it going. OK, so now I'm going to point out to you the magnets that I already did, point out to you the rails that I already did. Show you the rod that I'm going to slide along the rails and show you the uh, leads to the um, uh, galvanometer or the voltmeter. So that's a complete circuit there that I've made. But there's no EMF, no current right now, no induced EMF, no induced current uh, because I'm not moving the rod. Now watch. Watch that needle. As I move the rod to and fro, I'm deflecting the needle. From the translational motion of the rod, from the change in flux through the circuit, I'm creating an induced EMF. And so I, I hope you believe in this effect now that changing the, the magnetic flux through that circuit by changing the shape of the circuit, elongating or shrinking the circuit, creates an induced EMF, creates an induced current. Let me go back to my slides. And let's look at an example, an illustration of induced EMFs currents due to, um, due to translational motion. So um, here's a, a question. I've got to get the pen going again. We're told that in this arrangement here that we've been discussing, we've got a 27, 25 centimeter long uh, conducting rod. I, actually, this should be 35. And it's moving at constant speed over the two rails in a perpendicular magnetic field that's um, 0.3 Teslas in strength. So this is gonna induce an EMF, induce a current and uh, we're told the current here, induced current is 8.5 milliamps. And we're told that it's flowing through a nine ohm resistor. Um, if we know that the induced current is 8.5 milliamps and the resistance was nine ohms, we can quickly use Ohm's law, right? To figure out the induced EMF. The induced EMF is just the induced current times the resistance. And so I, I, I did that before doing any, answering any of the questions. The questions are, 
given this induced current, induced EMF, firstly, what's the rod speed? Secondly, what force am I applying to the rod? I have to push the rod. What force do I need to apply to the rod? And, and thirdly, if I'm applying a force, I'm doing work on the rod. What's the power so that I'm supplying to the rod? And if current is flowing through the resistor, then um, uh, energy is being dissipated in the resistor. What's the power dissipated in the resistor? So we're going to answer all those questions. So let's go through them. Okay, first one. What's the rod speed? Well, we already saw in our equation formula for um, induced EMS created by translational motion that the induced EMF was related to the speed. And so let's just use that relationship between the speed of the rod and the induced EMF to figure out the unknown speed from the known induced EMF. And so that's all I'm doing here. Didn't mean to do that. That's all I'm doing here. I'm taking that master equation that relates the induced EMF. That's kind of the result of the changing flux to the speed of the rod. That was the cause of the change in flux. So it's like cause and effect. And I'm just going to rearrange the equation to get the, um, the speed in terms of the induced EMF. The induced EMF we got from the induced current, it was um, it's 76 millivolts. Uh, the, the field that we're moving through is 0.3 teslas. The um, length of the rod was uh, 35 centimeters. And so I plug in all those numbers and I get this speed here. So I was moving the rod to create that induced current in that induced EMF. I was moving it about 0.7 meters per second. That's how fast I was pushing it. So that, that was easy. And, and it was just our understanding of that link connection between induced EMF, induced currents, and the motion that was causing the induced EMF, induced currents that, that allowed us to solve that. Okay, now here's an interesting point. So the second question was how much force do I have to apply to move the rod? An important point about this setup, this arrangement, is that you do have to apply a force to move the rod left to right, even though the you're moving the rod left to right at constant speed. So you might say, well, look, if the rod is just gliding left to right at constant speed, i.e. it's not speeding up, slowing down, accelerating, then why do, why do I need to apply a force to keep it moving across the rails? The reason that you need to apply a force to keep it moving across the rails is that actually in this problem, as we move the rod across the rails, there are two forces. It's important there's two forces. There's your applied force and there's also a magnetic force. The reason that you have to push the rod left to right is because that there's a magnetic force pushing in the other direction from right to left. So let me show you that. When we got the current flowing around the circuit, oh gosh. So current is flowing around this circuit. Induced current is flowing around this circuit. Look, I've got an arrow here indicating the current. It's flowing down this arm over here on the left-hand side and up the rod on the right-hand side and through the rails to complete the circuit. So this rod is carrying a current and it's carrying a current through a magnetic field. And so it will experience a magnetic force. Magnetic forces are created by electrical currents 
moving through regions of magnetic field or, or moving charges, moving through regions of magnetic field. And we, we've got those two ingredients, a, a magnetic field and moving charges or electrical current. So we're gonna get a magnetic force here. If we wanted the direction of the force, you could use your right hand rule. So you would point your right hand here. I would point my right hand in the direction of the current, which in the rod is upwards. So here we go upwards. I would curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. The magnetic field's into the screen, into the slide. So I'm curling my fingers in. And then my thumb will point in the direction of the the force. If you do this right now, look at the slide, point your hand upwards, that's the direction of the current. Um, point your um, fingers into the slide, that's the direction, um, that's the direction for the um, magnetic field. Your thumb's going to point over here towards the left. So that's the, um, that's the direction of the magnetic field. So the, the rod is actually being pushed towards the the left, so you have to push towards the right to overcome that. And so that's why there is a magnetic force in this, a, 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 an applied force in this problem. You have to push in this problem because there's an opposite magnetic force in this problem. It's like, you know, to lift an object, a ball up in the air, you have to apply a force against gravity. So here we're kind of applying a force against um, against magnetism. There's a question in chat about, is there a right hand rule for this problem? The right hand rule for this problem is the first right hand rule that we met. This is the right hand rule that I'm using. That's the right hand rule that tells you the relationship between the current, the field, and the resulting force. So my, I pointed my fingers in the direction of the current. I curled them in the direction of the field and my thumb was pointing in the direction of the force. It was the first right-hand rule that we met. Anyway, so now we know that we're applying a force because we're overcoming a magnetic force. Those two forces are equal and opposite. I just worry about the sizes. And that magnetic force is determined by the current flowing in the rod times the length of the rod times the field that it's immersed in times the sign of the angle between the current flow and the magnetic field. That's actually 90 degrees in our situation. And so we figured that we do need a force because we've got to overcome the magnetic force and we can find the size of that applied force by equating it to the magnetic force and filling in how the force depends on the current that's flowing, uh, the um, current that's flowing, the magnetic field, and the, um, the orientation of those two things. And so that's what I did here. And so I multiplied the current times the length of the rod times the strength of the field times the sine of the angle between the current direction and the field direction, that's 90 degrees. And here's, here's the force that I apply and that the magnetic field applies. Okay, there's a great question in the chat and I, I should have mentioned this. So, to figure out the direction of the force, I needed the direction of the current. So how did I get the direction of the current? I got the direction of the current with last class's Lenz's law. So in this problem, as the rod rolls left to right, more and more flux, more and more field lines pass into the slide through the circuit. So by Lenz's law, by Lenz's law, there's going to be induced magnetic field and an induced current that's in the opposite direction. So the induced field is out of the slide. It's in the direction opposite to the, the external field that's drawn on the slide. 
if that induced field is out of the slide, then you can use this other right hand rule for um, current loops, where your fingers curl in the direction of the, um, the current in the loop and the thumb points in the direction of the field. I'm going to point my thumb out. Uh, my fingers, if my thumb of my right hand is pointing out of the screen, are curling counterclockwise around the circuit. And so that's how, that was a really good point. I, I should have mentioned that, forgot to mention that, how I got the current direction. Last part of the problem. And this is an interesting part of the problem too. You are pushing the rod from left to right. And current is flowing through the circuit, through the resistor. From an energy perspective, or a power's perspective, what's happening? What's happening from an energy perspective is you're putting power in to the circuit because you're applying a force which is transferring energy, which is doing work. Um, also from an energy perspective, the circuit is dissipating energy in the resistor. The resistor is getting hot due to the current flowing through the resistor. So from an energy perspective, we're seeing energy flow in as I push the rod across the circuit and energy flow out as the rod heats up, uh, sorry, as the circuit heats up the resistor. So there's power in or energy in, there's power out, energy out. Power in because I'm exerting a force on the rod, power out because there's current flowing through the resistor. And we can calculate those two powers and I've done that on this slide. here and here. So P subscript S is the power supplied. So that's the power I'm putting in by my force. P subscript D, that's the power dissipated. That's the power going to heat in the resistor. So these are the in and out powers. Now we met a, a formula. This is in 211, apologies for that. Uh, we met a formula for the power supplied by a force, it's force times velocity. It's a, a friend, a relation to, to work done is force times distance. So this is force times velocity. Well, we know the force that I'm exerting. We know the velocity of the rod. And so we just multiply them to get the power that's delivered. It's 0.6 milliwatts is the power I'm dissipating, uh, delivering, power I'm supplying. So that's easy. Now think about the resistor. The resistor is carrying a current, and so it's getting hot, it's being heated up, and uh, we've met equations for the power dissipated in a resistor. One version of them is it's I squared R, the square of the current times the resistance of the resistance. Well, we also know the induced current and the resistance of the resistor. And if I square up the current and multiply by the resistance, I get the power dissipated, and that also is 0.6 milliwatts. And what we're seeing here, this is the magic of energy, and energy conservation, and energy flow. I'm pumping energy into the circuit by pushing in the rod. So energy is flowing in from me, and the rod is, sorry, the circuit is pumping energy out of the circuit into heat. And the energy I'm putting in, 0.6 milliwatts, is equal to the energy that's flowing out. The, the circuit is really just transferring it from one, receiving it in one form, motional kinetic energy, delivering it to another form, heat, heat energy. Okay, so that was that example, that illustration. I just want to make a remark about that arrangement of the rod rolling across the rails. I want to compare it to a, uh, an old arrangement that we've met before, a circuit involving a battery. 
this new circuit, the rod rolling across the rails, is an old circuit, the battery and a resistor. They're actually, at first sight, they look so different, right? Oh, they can't be the same. They, they look completely different. But from a electrical energy perspective, they're really very similar. The battery or the moving rod, they're both sources of electromotive forces that will generate uh, electrical currents. So they both produce EMFs and both drive currents. Uh, the battery and the rod are both supplying energy to the circuit, both supplying power to the circuit. And on the left-hand side of the circuit, the current through the resistor, and the left-hand side of this circuit, the current through the resistor, things just look the same. We built the same circuits evolving currents through a resistor, but we've just got different ways of supplying the energy, the power, the the in the EMF. So we call this guy, the moving rod, a, a generator, an electrical generator. And we might call this guy, the battery, a chemical generator. They generate induced EM, they generate EMFs that drive the currents. They generate the power and energy that's supplied to the circuit. And so um, what we invented over here on the left is a electrical generator that acts similarly to this electrical battery over here on the right. And that's what, you know, in a power station, in a power station, motion movement gets turned into electrical currents, electrical energy. And that's what this arrangement did. It turned motion movement into electrical energy, electrical power. And that's how our modern lifestyle started with being able to deliver electrical energy, electrical power to all our houses and whatever and so forth. Okay. Second topic, I want to talk about um, induction occurring from rotational rather than translational motion. So it's in a way, it's very similar to the first topic of how translational motion uh, creates induced EMFs, induced currents. Now we're going to talk about how rotational motion creates induced EMFs, induced currents. And so um, here's an introduction to that. And we're going to see how, oops, but there's a typo here. I better correct this. This is cutting, cutting and pasting gets you in more trouble than it's worth. This is rotational motion with angular velocity omega. Okay, so let's take a look at this sketch here. Again, it's quite a busy sketch. And so we want to think about it for a bit and understand it, make sure we do understand it. So in this sketch, like the previous example, I've got a region of magnetic field. So here I've got a, say a bar magnet, North Pole, and another bar magnet, South Pole. And um, field lines sprout out of the North Pole and, and head into the South Pole. And so what was in green and is now in red are the field lines that stream from left to right here and create a region of magnetic field. So in that region of magnetic field, let clean this up a bit. I've got a wire loop. And you can see that wire loop there. Um, here it is, like so. And I can 
rotate that wire loop. I can put rotational kinetic energy into that wire loop by turning that wire loop, by exerting a torque on that wire loop. And that's what I'm doing. And so this is another way of moving, moving electrical conductors through magnetic fields. Like the previous example showed us how we were moving a electrical conductor, the single rod there, through a magnetic field. Um, probably the best way to think about this case is to think about this arm of the loop here and this arm of the loop here, these two horizontal arms. The one, and think about this rotation that's clockwise. So right now, the one on the left, this one here, is kind of moving upwards through the magnetic field as it rotates. And the one on the right down here is kind of moving downwards through the magnetic field. And so you can see that, like in the last example, we had a single rod moving left to right. Now we've got a pair of rods, one moving up through a magnetic field and one moving down through a magnetic field. This time as we rotate things rather than translate things. There is a changing magnetic flux through this rectangular circuit. So for example, if this loop was in the horizontal plane, no field lines would pass through it, so there'd be no flux. If the, the loop is vertical, so if it was this, there's no flux through it. If it's vertical, then there's maximum flux through it. Look, here come the field lines passing through it. So you can imagine as it's rotating, the, the, the flux is through the loop is going up and down, it's going positive and negative, it's going through zero. So there's a changing flux through the loop. And so there's going to be an induced EMF, an induced current in the loop. And so we can use Faraday's law. It tells us that the induced current is the magnitude of it is determined by the rate of change of the flux through the loop. And that flux through the loop is changing. And here's for now this rotational rather than translational motion, the equation for that flux. And let me explain some of the things that that flux will depend on. And I, I'm, again, I'm not deriving this equation for you. We're using this equation, but I'm going to argue it. It makes sense, makes a lot of sense. B, right? B is the magnetic field again. So if we turned off the magnetic field and rotated it, there'd be no change in flux. So we'd get no induced EMF. So that makes sense. If it was a stronger magnetic field, there would be a greater rate of change of magnetic flux. We get a bigger induced EMF. So that makes sense. If it was a weak magnetic field, we get a smaller rate of change of magnetic flux and we get a small induced EMF. So that all that makes sense. A. A is the area of the loop. So that's the area of the loop, the cross-sectional area of this loop, the number of square centimeters or the number of square millimeters and the number of square meters. If you make a bigger loop, right, you'll capture more field lines and the rate at which the flux changes will be larger. If you get a smaller loop, a tiny loop, you capture less field lines and the rate at which the flux is changing will be smaller. So it makes sense that the um, induced EMF depends on the area of the loop. If you make a vanishingly small loop, you'll have vanishingly small flux, and so you would have no induced EMF. So that A makes sense. Who's this N? Where did she come from? She's the number of turns of the loop. So I pictured a loop here that really just had one complete turn. In practice, if you were building this, you'd make many complete turns every turn that you make has a flux through it. And so the, the total flux through the loop and the rate of change of the flux through the loop depends on how many turns of loop you have. And so that's the reason for the end. 
And then finally, right, you need motion to change the, change the flux through the loop. With no motion, there would be no induced EMF, no induced current. And omega is the angular velocity we're rotating this loop. Omega is the radians per second at which we rotate the loop. And if we rotate it fast, then omega is going to be big. We get a big induced DMF, omega small, then um, we're going to get a small induced DMF. So the, this omega here makes sense too. Let me show you a second video to demonstrate this type of generator. Well, this, these induced EMFs due to rotational motion. So I'm going to again share a different screen here. So in this video, you're seeing a couple of things. You're seeing, um, firstly, a, a magnet, a region of magnetic field. So over here in red is the north pole of the magnet, and over here in blue is the south pole of the magnet. Magnetic field lines are streaking left to right between these two poles. So this region here has a magnetic field that's left to right. Uh, there's a coil of wire in here. You see the copper color? That's copper wire. That's a copper coil of wire. And there's many turns in this, not just one turn like in the sketch. There's many, many, many turns, hundreds, hundreds of turns. Here's a wheel. And I can turn the wheel and I can rotate the coil. And so I can rotate the coil through the magnetic field and then finally, slightly obscured here, the ends of the wire, like in the diagram, are attached to a lamp, a light. And we're going to try and light the light by rotating the coil in the magnetic field. With the idea that rotating the coil in the magnetic field changes the flux through the coil, which will induce an EMF and induce current in the coil, which will light the light. Great idea. Where did I go? Oh, I'm here. Okay, so I'm showing you the magnet poles again. I'm showing you the coil and it can be moved, rotated. It's on an axle. And then I'm going to start rotating it and watch that, watch this light here. Hey, you see it lit up. It's a little hard to see here. You can see it flicker a little bit. So the rate at which it lights up and flickers depends on how fast I turn that uh, handle, how fast I rotate the coil. I'm going to, so I went and turned the lights off. It's a little scary, but I wanted to do it um, because I wanted you to see, I'm rotating it now and you see the lamp lit. So it really is lit. So that's rotational motion that's creating um, induced currents and induced EMFs. Let me go back to my slides. So I hope we believe in that. On this slide, I've just added a sketch, added a drawing of the induced EMF. Added a sketch of the induced EMF as a function of time. So I've got to get the pen working again. There must be a way to avoid that. So this is the sketch I'm talking about. Look, horizontally, 
horizontally is time. And vertically is the induced EMF. And so you see that the induced EMF is not constant in this case. The induced EMF um, peaks, goes to zero, peaks in the opposite direction for the current, goes to zero, peaks again, peaks again, goes through zeros again and again. That time dependence is this guy here that I didn't talk about on the last slide, the sine omega t. That time dependence is because in this case, when you rotate the loop, the rate at which the flux is changing rate at which the flux is changing through the circuit, the time rate of change of the flux isn't constant. It was in the translational motion case, it's not in the rotational motion case. When the, when the circuit, the loop of wire is horizontal in this left right magnetic field, there's no flux through that circuit. And any little rotation of the circuit, clockwise, counterclockwise, will change the flux a lot. So you get big induced EMFs here. When the arm of the circuit, when the face of the circuit is vertical in this, in this horizontal magnetic field, then there is a flux through here but tiny changes, rotations of it, left or right, don't change that flux very much. So these peaks, when the loop of wire is horizontal, that's when you get big changes in flux. And these zeros are when the loop of wire is vertical. That's when you get barely any change of flux. And the sine omega t function maps out, describes exactly how that rate of change of flux is varying as a function of the, um, the angle, the orientation of the loop of wire. So that's that final piece in there. And again, this should have said rotational. Okay, let's look at an example. Let's look at an illustration of um, induced currents, induced EMFs due to rotational motion. So we're gonna look at this example here. Uh, and it's exactly the one I demonstrated actually. In the demonstration, there was a, uh, a North Pole and a South Pole that created this kind of horizontal magnetic field. We rotated a loop of wire, actually many turns of wire through that field with the handle. So this was me rotating, putting in rotational kinetic energy. And uh, we lit a lamp through this external circuit. That's exactly what we did. In this case, we're told that the area of the loop is 0.2 square meters. It's got a thousand turns and it's rotated at 60 revolutions a second. Well, I didn't do that, obviously, in a point to Tesla field. And we've got to find the maximum induced EMF. So let's see if we can do that. Okay, so the key point is that that sine function, gosh, I really need some help today on this one. Why can't I do this? Okay. I'm going to try and stay calm. I'm going to try and use the pen without changing the slides. Let's see if I'm capable of doing this. 
Yeah, it's a matter of staying like many things in life. It's a matter of just staying calm and um, slowing things down and then you can do it. When you speed up and you get panicked, you can't do it. Okay. Um, therapy lesson over. Let's get on with the problem. Uh, what's the maximum induced EMF? Maximum induced EMF is when the flux is changing fastest. The sine omega t function tells you when the flux is changing fastest. It's when that fu function has its maximum value. Its maximum value is one. So that corresponds to the maximum EMF. So actually, if you plug in sine omega t equals one, the maximum EMF is this simple equation here. It's just the number of turns times the magnetic field times the area of the loop times the angular velocity you're rotating at. And all of those things we were, were kind of listed, conveniently listed for us in the problem. Uh, the field was 0.2 Teslas. The number of turns was 1,000. The um, rotation was at 60 revolutions per second. Important point, you've got to use radians per second here. So you got multiplied by two pi, you get 377 radians per second. And the area of the loop um, was point, point 0.1 square meters. Anyway, so I plugged in all those numbers and here's the voltage. 7.5 kilovolts. Now, remember back to the translational motion case I showed you. The voltage there was millivolts. And now we got a voltage of kilovolts. And the lesson here is that the translational motion generating induced currents, induced EMFs as an electrical generator is difficult in practice. Rotational motion creating electrical currents um, uh, induced EMFs is much easier in practice. So if you were to go to a power station and say, can, can I see how you, excuse me, can I see how you make the power, manufacture the power? I, you, you're right that the, I just saw in chat that the area in the last slide was 0.2 square meters and now I've calculated it with 0.1 square meters. Um, so let's imagine I've gone back in time and I wrote 0.1 square meters on the last slide. I should have done that. If you go to the power station and ask the power station manager to show you how they're, what motion they're using to create the electrical energy that we use in our houses, it's not translational motion. They're not running up and down the power station with a rod across some rails, that's for sure. They're rotating something at high speed, a coil of wire at high speed through a magnetic field. That's how they're making the kilovolt induced EMFs that are used to, by the power lines, deliver power to, um, to all our homes and businesses, et cetera, and et cetera. Okay, I got a quiz. So, so transformer induction is the case when you don't have moving parts. And um, in the two examples we looked at in today's class, we, we had moving parts uh, that created, you know, translational motion of the circuit, rotational motion of the circuit that created the induced EMFs. So in translational induction, the induced EMFs, the induced currents are not created by motion, but they're created by a time varying magnetic field, a time changing magnetic field. And so we're going to discuss this in the next class, but I want to show you a demonstration of it. And so I'm going to share a different screen here. And so I hope you can see this screen. And right now what I'm showing you here is a, 
actually an electrical circuit. And it might be a little hard to see, but there's an electrical circuit that has a, a battery here, a coil of wire here, and then a switch here. And so that's just a circuit with a solenoid or a coil and a battery and a switch. And so if I close the switch, I can energize the coil. If I open the switch, I can de-energize the coil. Attached to the coil, to the two ends of the coil, is another arm of the circuit. Here's one lead on the left, here's another lead on the right that has a, bat, has a bulb in it. And there's a very interesting thing about this circuit. The battery downstairs here, you might be able to read it, it says nine volts. The bulb up here, you see the 60 volts, it requires 60 volts to activate it. So switching the circuit on or off, energizing or de-energizing the solenoid shouldn't light the bulb, can't light the bulb because the bulb requires 60 volts and the battery is only nine volts. But what we're gonna see actually is that the bulb does light at the moment that you switch on and off the circuit. And it does light because of the induced EMFs, the induced currents in the circuit. So let's just watch this. Uh, why has it done that? For some reason we're seeing the whole thing up in this little corner. And I don't know why that is. But anyway, let's all look up here. Oh. Made it a little bigger. I'm showing you the circuit and I'm showing you the arm here with the bulb in it. And then I'm showing you it actually on the equipment here. And now I'm, I'm pressing the switch. So I'm energizing and de-energizing the circuit repeatedly. And maybe you can just see flickers of the bulb. And what I'm gonna do is turn the lights out and do the same thing. I'm gonna keep energizing the circuit and de-energizing You see flashes. Those flashes are just the instance at which I energize and de-energize the circuit. And those flashes are due to the induced EMFs, the induced currents that are created by time varying magnetic fields. So this is a very subtle effect. And we think of it as due to circuits talking either to themselves as other circuits or talking to other circuits. And it's how cell phones work, for example. And so this is called transformer induction. Uh, it's due to time varying magnetic fields. And we're gonna discuss that in the, in the next class. So let me end there.